President Ocker, Ambassador White, and Sue Mays, who's done so much to make this evening and this lecture series possible. I'm pleased to be here, and I'm honored, of course, to be the chair of the Lou Douglas Lecture Series. Fortunately, as the chair, I have not had large responsibilities, which I couldn't discharge. And one of the reasons is, of course, that we've had an excellent steering committee here in Manhattan. And I would like to call your attention to the names that are on the back of your program, because these are the people who've done the work and made this tonight's lecture and past and future lectures possible. I'm not going to attempt to express all of my feelings about Lou Douglas. I'm sure I cannot do it. But I think of two things when I think of Lou. I think of integrity. I think his integrity was complete. And he did and spoke out on many issues with more courage than almost any person I know throughout the decade or so that I knew him. The other word I think of is caring, because Lou cared not only about the less animate group of humanity as a whole, but he cared about those close to him, and I think this was reflected in all that, that Lou did. So it's a great honor to be a chairman of such a series. I do feel that we all want to see this series extend in the, to the years to come, and I think we realize that this is partially supported by individual contributions. And those contributions have made this year's lecture series assured and complete, but there's next year and the following year. And therefore, I would urge you to look at the envelope which you have in your hand and to ask what you can do and to support this series in any way that you can. So again, thank you for the privilege of being here. And I hope that I can be with you for many of these series lectures throughout the years to come. Thank you very much. In his later years, Lou Douglas invested much time and energy in a valuable adjunct to Kansas State University, the University for Man. The University of Man has taken heavy responsibilities in helping to organize this series, and I would like to have you meet Ms. Sue Mays, who is the director of University for Man. Sue? And now it is my pleasure as president of Kansas State University to introduce to you Mr. Robert E. White, who is the former United States Ambassador to El Salvador, a career Foreign Service officer for the past 26 years. Mr. White's early service included assignments to the United Nations, Hong Kong, Canada, Ecuador, Dominican Republic, and other areas of Central America. From 1968 to 1970, he served with the Peace Corps as director for Latin America. This was followed by tours as deputy chief of mission in Managua from 1970 to 1972, and Bogota from 1972 to 75. He was deputy United States permanent representative to the Organization of American States from 1975 to 1977, and from 1977 to 1980, he served as the ambassador, the United States ambassador to Paraguay. Most recently, Mr. White served as ambassador to El Salvador from March 7 of 1980 to January of 1981. I give to you Ambassador Robert E. White, Mr. White. It's a, <clears throat> a great uh, pleasure to be here with uh, all of you this evening and to share with you some thoughts and some of my uh, experiences or insights into El Salvador and Central America. It's, it is the fate of small nations to
to have their destiny determined or affected in part for them by greater, by great powers. In the 19th century, Great Britain and France determined the future of the greater part of Africa and Asia. Today, developing countries who live, which live in the shadow of the superpowers must cope with that reality and choose their response to political, social, and economic progress with a very close eye on the superpower's reaction to the threat of change. Now, one of the questions we should ask ourselves is, was there a real need for a revolution in El Salvador? And I ran across this quote from The Economist, which said that working people eventually will revolt against any system of social organization based on exploitation by a single class, feudalism by aristocrats, capitalism by monopolists, and now socialism by apparatchiks. Now clearly the last reference is to the magnificent struggle of the Polish workers to win control of their uh, lives in, uh, in Eastern Europe. But the other two statements, uh, feudalism by aristocrats and capitalism by monopolists, applies very well to El Salvador. The political history, in a nutshell, is this. Since 1931, the oligarchy has ruled through the military, uh, pr practically speaking, uninterruptedly. Uh, to give you an example, in 1972, Napoleon Duarte, the president of the government today, was elected president. There's no advisor that doubts, there's no uh, expert on the subject that doubts this, but he was prevented from taking office because his program of what was really very mild reform was too much uh, uh, to be permitted. And what has happened as a result of this is forms part of the tragedy of El Salvador because you form political institutions in order to gain access to power. And if power is denied you, then these political institutions will atrophy and disappear. And this is indeed what has happened, uh, that as a practical matter, this is uh, El Salvador is a country that has lost all of its, uh, of the institutions that generally uh, go along with a civilized uh, country, a civilized nation. Economically, it, El Salvador had perhaps the worst income inequality in Latin America. Sixty percent of the people earned less than the equivalent of two hundred and fifty dollars. According to the Food and Agricultural uh, Organization, the malnutrition was the worst in Latin America. And according to a Cornell study, the highest percentage of landless and near landless peoples uh, lived, uh, El Salvador was the, was the country with the highest percentage of landless and near landless people in the world. Second was Bangladesh. So this will give you an idea of how radicalized uh, this, the situation was in El Salvador and is. Now the United States, I'd like to move rapidly into the United States treatment of a policy towards El Salvador, which was not all that different from United States policy generally towards 
Latin America, except for the brief interlude of the Alliance for Progress, uh, we neglected the area. To, this, to the extent that we paid any attention to it, the basic contribution was to shore up the economic elites and support the military. I put it to you that Hannah Arendt, who is correct when she says the leitmotif of American attitudes toward the developing world since World War II has been fear of revolution. And because of this fear of revolution, we developed uh, counterinsurgency, we developed in effect a counter-revolutionary program that identified the United States with the past and not with the future. We uncritically supported dictatorships, we winked at repression, tolerated corruption, and participated in the perversion of the democratic process. Now, in El Salvador, in response to really conditions that were subhuman, a number of things began to happen. The yeast began to rise. And one of the very few institutions there really were that, that uh, is active in El Salvador was the church. And many of the priests and nuns and lay workers began really what amounted to a campaign of consciousness raising, uh, in f telling the poor people that they did not have to live in these subhuman conditions and uh, encouraging them to organize and to make demands for better housing, etc. They also, uh, they, and from these, from, the, from this consciousness raising, you had the emergence of the, uh, the so-called popular blocks, which really were mass groups that started out under church control but uh, started out under church sponsorship, but soon emancipated themselves from the church and became really, uh, had a life of their own, to the point that they became, in some, to some degree, guerrilla organizations and to some degree uh, mass uh, strike uh, groups. Now, predictably, this attempt by the campesinos, an attempt by the urban workers to organize, met a harsh response from the landowners. And the people who were the, in the lead as organizers and their chief lieutenants were either killed or driven off the land and had to seek refuge in mountain air, mountainous or remote areas. And this is really the origin of your guerrilla movement. It's uh, pe displaced people, people driven out of their, uh, their native villages by security forces and having to seek shelter in remote areas. Now, in the process of this, the church became very, uh, quite radicalized in the sense that they, they, their commit, the church's commitment to the poor and their commitment that they made to help the poor better their state in life resulted in the death and torture of so many that the church really became to some degree part of this uh, upward movement of, of the poor, which was revolutionary in nature. The problem, one of the great problems, however, is that up until now, at least, there's only been one model for revolution in Latin America, and that's been the Castro model, because the United States, by placing itself directly against revolution, uh, gave the free gift uh, to 
the communists that they were on the side of change and on the side of progress when of course 95% uh, of the people who were in the vanguard of change were, no, were, were not communist and were even anti-communist but if there is no other model to follow then of course they will follow the model that is available and to that regrettably uh, a, gr a large number of the leaders of the leftist movement did become Marxist, Leninists, and committed to that philosophy and that type of society. Now you can mark the every uh, the history of Central America uh, sort of as before Samosa and after Samosa, because. With the fall of Samosa, uh, people began to realize that it really was possible to affect change. And I suppose this might be a good place to, to emphasize that there really is not, a lot of people make the mistake of seeing an analogy between Nicaragua and El Salvador. Remember, in, in Nicaragua, it was not really the Sandinistas, the young revolutionaries, who won, the, who overthrew Somoza. The most conservative elements of the society had become anti Somoza. And it was in the final analysis, probably the business community. Of, of Nicaragua that contributed more than anything else to Somoza's overthrow because if when the Sandinistas would call a general strike the business people would simply close their businesses and go home and as a result the economy ground to a halt. But in El Salvador you don't have uh, this personalized conflict. In El Salvador it really has become uh, a class struggle and, and with a great deal of complexity as I'll try to state for you briefly. Now the fall of Samosa of course had also a tremendous effect on the United States. We finally realized the truth of what John Kennedy had told us 15, 20 years before that those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. And therefore, the United States made the conscious decision to back change in Central America. And the first impact of this, of our new policy, was felt in El Salvador. Indeed, it was designed for El Salvador. We, in early 1979, just after the uh, Sandinistas, the new, uh, just after Somoza had been overthrown and the new government had come in, the government of President Romero in El Salvador was totally unable to keep order except by widespread killing and hundreds, literally 100,000, 150,000 people would go out into the streets of the capital San Salvador and bring the entire city to a stop. Now the United States made a deliberate effort to show its non-support of this traditional government of President Romero. And as a result of that and as a result of other things, there occurred what became known as the October 15th, 1979, the October 15th Revolution. And the installation of a mixed military civilian junta 
government. And this government started out with great expectations from everyone. It was supported in the United States, it was supported in Europe, it was supported within the country. But within two and a half months, that government fell apart. Why? Well, the reason usually given is military intransigence, and that is certainly a major factor. Uh, the military of El Salvador are very reluctant revolutionaries, and it's, uh, it's hard to bring them to uh, accept change. But we also have to flag the fact that these civilians who made up the new government and who are unquestionably the best people in El Salvador, best by that I mean uh, the most intelligent, the most moral, the people who had really stood for high standards and for progressive change. But they were also, unfortunately, inexperienced and naive. And, and of course, I do not mean that in any pejorative way, because there had, there had never been the opportunity for them to gain political experience. They never, had, they never had had the opportunity to learn the art of governing. But it is, I think, a measure of the group that left, that they really expected to change the reality of El Salvador in two and a half months. Uh, now, when that government fell apart, this was a crucial decision. If at that point, at that point the United States had a great, had a, a terribly important choice to make. And there were voices on all sides in Washington on this. And one voice predictably was saying, we made a mistake moving with, cha with these young and inexperienced people. The military is still the only reality in El Salvador. They can control the situation with our help. Back the traditional elites, send in military advisors and military assistance, and go with the status quo. Then there was another group in Washington who believed that this, it, that uh, not only was it inevitable that the leftist forces would win out, but that, it, that this was precisely the time to support the left because the moderates in the left still had ascendancy over, uh, ascendancy or at least they had a great deal of power uh, over the Marxist-Leninist element in the, uh, in the popular bloc. Out of this clash came what some people think was a truly creative response uh, to a challenge and others condemn as a, the backing of a rightist government in disguise. The, a second junta, a second government was formed, this time with the same military people, but with Christian Democratic, with the, with the participation of the Christian Democratic Party. Now, whatever you may think about events as they've unfolded over the past year, there's one thing I want to uh, advance for your consideration. While it's true that the civilians in the first government were worthy, intelligent, honorable people, it is also true that the civilians in the second government had the same, if not better, democratic credentials. Napoleon Duarte was elected president in 1972 
when he refused to go take his, uh, the stealing of his election peacefully, uh, he was tortured and would have been killed except for the intervention of, uh, of Venezuela and the Vatican. And, uh, the United States didn't do anything, but he did come to here and spent some time at Notre Dame University and then went to Venezuela where he lived in exile for eight years. And the other member of the junta, Dr. Morales Erich, was had been mayor of San Salvador, had also been uh, arrested a number of times and had been exiled too because of his democratic beliefs. So my point is that at this time the United States was not backing a odious dictator all, uh, all along the lines of Somoza, we were actually backing a government that had uh, a truly democratic component. Now what did this second government do, this second junta? Well, it, it, unquestionably this government, the present government, has in the sense of reform, of changing the life of the people, changing the structure of the country, has done more than all the other governments of El Salvador combined. The, they have launched the most thorough agrarian reform since the agrarian reform in Mexico. They nationalized the banks and they nationalized the export sector. And but it's the agrarian reform. The agrarian reform is the linchpin of their, their contribution to the people of El Salvador. And the reform is not only economic and social, it's political, because what the agrarian reform has done is break the back of the oligarchy, the 14 families, practically none of whom live in El Salvador anymore, most of whom live in Miami or Guatemala City or wherever. Uh, and so this has had an absolutely tremendous impact. And the, uh, the, the grand reform continues, and if it does continue, uh, then this government will succeed uh, in having done something positive for the people of El Salvador. And one of the reasons you can state without any fear of contradiction that this government has been effective is because the right wing, this combination of the landed elite and the military, or certain elements of the military, have launched at least three serious attempted coups to try and overthrow this government. Now you don't pay out millions of dollars to overthrow a government unless it has hurt you badly, and unless you want to change uh, uh, that government for, to your benefit. So this has been the response of the right. Try to overthrow the government, hire uh, people out of the security forces to form death squads and kill young people on the mere suspicion that they are involved in the guerrilla movement or that they are sympathetic with the guerrilla movement. And this, of course, is the um, negative side of this government, which I would never want to underplay. The repression is very real. Now, what has been the response of the left? Because you often hear a great deal about repression from the right, but you don't often hear about the repression that take, comes from the left also. Now, their ca the cause of the left began to fail when the government undertook serious reforms with the support of the United States. And, and this is terribly important, when the United States decided 
to oppose its traditional friends, the, uh, the, the rich of El Salvador, and oppose them not only privately, but publicly. Speak out and say that the, that the agrarian reform is, is good and we are backing it. These other reforms are good and necessary and we are backing them. We no longer want a re, uh, to see any return to the past and we explicitly condemn your financing of right wing, of, of death squads, etc. So what we did was finally stop hedging our bets and go with a reform government and against the right. This cut the ground out from under the left. In effect, the Duarte government stole the program of the left, which was basically, in a phrase, agrarian reform. And so the left gradually lost its capacity to put people into the streets. And the left then reacted to this lack of enthusiasm for the leftist cause or the declining enthusiasm with terrorism. They would call a general strike and when the buses began to, uh, when the buses didn't observe the strike, they'd pull a bus driver off the bus and execute him in front of the passengers to, you know, dramatize that they meant business. They kidnapped people and held them for huge amounts of ransom and if it wasn't paid, executed them. And here is where the left began to lose what's so vital to any leftist movement in Latin America, that is moral authority. Because the democratic elements in the far left, in the leftist movement, did not condemn this type of activity. And in effect, they countenanced it. And whereas the government uh, the civilians in the government and the moderate military leaders explicitly condemned the death squads and tried, well, here you get into some, a very uh, difficult area, but at least there was some progress made. But what you have to understand about the left is that there is within the extreme left, within this armed Marxist, uh, Leninist guerrilla movement, a philosophy that of terrorism, a philosophy that rejects political, the political process, which, which believes that the only way the uh, the society can regenerate itself is through violence and through the left taking power by force and violence. And in, in my view, this is a not only erroneous creed, but a destructive one because politics are a necessary part of the machinery of civilization. Now, what was the response of the United States to this situation? First, we gave economic assistance for the reforms. Secondly, we rejected both extremes and tried to build up the center, the Christian Democrats. We gave a bare minimum of military assistance and all of that non-lethal and all of that conditioned on improved human rights performance by the military. And while we made few gains in that human rights area, there was some evidence of progress. Now, so here is a situation 
that we have, say, three months ago. The left is declining. It has a definite loss of support. But it does have a veto. It can ruin the economy through strikes, through constant turmoil, keeping the country in constant turmoil. The right has no popular support to speak of. Its objective is also to break the economy by keeping the death squads in motion. The history of the past year has been the civilian component of the government trying to gain some mastery over the military, some authority over the military. And some members of the military going along with this and others resisting it. Now, but, but the, the trend was clearly in the right direction. But now we come to our own presidential campaign and the time between November 4th and January 20th. It's difficult for those of you who live in the United States to realize how intensely the people of Central America follow our elections. And there's a very good reason why they follow our elections so closely. It has a far greater impact on their lives than it does on ours. They, uh, that's hard to, uh, for you to believe, but it's the absolute truth. And the signals coming out of the campaign from a variety of sources was that uh, we were going to uh, destabilize Cuba, that we were going to go after Nicaragua, etc. And when you had, when the Reagan victory came about, the Central Americans really are not sophisticated enough, most of them, to realize the difference between campaign rhetoric and what things will be like after, you know, the responsibilities of power take over. And so they, uh, and so it was at this point that Nicaragua made a terrible mistake. It felt the only way that it could consolidate its revolution was if the left in El Salvador won the day. And so, for this reason, they provided military assistance, sophisticated arms in great quantity. They permitted their territory to be used to channel arms into the country of El Salvador. And, they and then at that point, when they got the arms in there, the left declared the so-called final offensive. The final offensive was declared early in January with the objective of achieving a leftist, if not a total victory, at least the capturing of a definite piece of territory where they could declare the independent republic of El Salvador. But it was a failure. And it failed because they gave a war and nobody came. The people are sick and tired of violence. The reforms have uh, helped uh, the people. They see some hope for a better life, and so they won't respond. And therefore, it's important to note that when we sent military advisors and military assistance into El Salvador, the left had already failed. Uh, without the United States sending one single cartridge to El Salvador. Now, the right also received this certain signals, which they thought meant that when the new administration came in, they would have the support of the new administration. 
And so they began to intensify certain of their uh, certain activities. One of which was, for example, they assassinated the land reform advisors and the chief of the land reform in order to try to bring the land reform to a halt. Uh, they also assassinated the leftist uh, leaders. Uh, the, the, there was a group of leaders that were known as the high command of the Frente Democratico, and they killed these men uh, in late November. And these were the more moderate elements that might have served as a bridge between the government and the and the leftist uh, and the left. I'll close in a few seconds. I want to uh, read to you. There's a there's a wonderful article by a man named Stanley Hoffman, in which he says it's in the foreign policy this current issue. And he says that the basic problem of U.S. foreign policy is a craving for simplicity. And he said, it is, if, it is as if two archetypes only were competing for American approval. The Popeye archetype of the United States as the guardian of law and order, ensuring stability and general happiness through strength and toughness and the archetype of the missionary United States, helping the poor abroad and bringing its values to those who suffer in the dark. But today's world fits neither scheme. The reactions of much of the American political class, of some of the intellectual establishment, and a majority of the public reminds one of, one of the behavior of the patient who, disliking what he reads on his thermometer, breaks it. Instead of examining the reasons for the divorce between these archetypes, the Popeye syndrome and the missionary syndrome, and the real world, many Americans prefer to blame other Americans. The purists tend to indict a corrupt, militaristic, or capitalist establishment for the failure of America's missionary vocation to rid the world of political and economic diseases. Those in the grip of a high noon vision of America's role abroad blame the naive idealists, the tiresome exponents of complexity, the liberals who do not understand power, the writers who may be soft on communism, or the famous McGovern wing of the Democratic Party that supposedly captured the Carter administration. They have gone dangerously far in convincing not only themselves and the American public, but even American, America's friends and foes that America has been dragged into decline by their domestic enemies. Internal settlement of accounts substitute for an appraisal of the state of the world. And I think that's very close to what we're in, the situation we're into today regarding Central America, where the desire of the new administration to show itself to be tough and to differentiate itself from the human rights softy approach of the past administration has resulted in this, what he says is, the internal settlement of accounts which substitutes for an accurate appraisal of the state of the world, or in this case, the state of Central America. The, uh, it was my position, I guess, that at, w at one point, a year, or a year and a half ago, it would have been possible to work with the left. But a combination of events and a different policy, 
a sophisticated policy by the United States uh, changed that situation very rapidly and created a new force, a force, a government which was supporting structural change, which had written off the right wing, which was helping shift the, the loyalty of the military from its traditional allies, the oligarchy, to this, to a more normal, civilized, uh, democratic type state. But unfortunately, in the last two months, it seems to me, all this subtlety and understanding have yielded to a dangerous mix of contradictory statements and conflicting goals. To a government which has been pleading for economic assistance to achieve its reforms, we have sent unneeded military equipment. To a people crying out for a negotiated settlement, we have sent unwanted military advisors. To moderate civilian and military leaders desperately trying to contain the excesses of the security forces, we have given an abandonment of our human rights policy. To a fledgling, to a failing Marxist-Leninist left, which had demonstrated again its political and military weakness, we have presented a propaganda victory by magnifying out of all proportion its the threat, their threat. To a disbelieving world, we have trumpeted charges of a, quote, textbook case of indirect armed aggression by communist powers, unquote an accusation I very much doubt can be made to stand up. And to world leaders who believe that the United States had finally learned that counter-revolution is not an adequate response to a people determined to transform their country, we have responded to their complex and tragic dilemma with Cold War rhetoric and big stick diplomacy. Now, fortunately, there are some signs to which indicate to me that the policy is changing. And I think that the policy is changing because of outrage uh, in the world and here at home. And I think the fact that we have an overflow audience here tonight is something that the new administration uh, never dreamed of. I think that they felt that they could send military equipment. <laughs> I think they could thought they could send military equipment, military advisors, and win this sort of uh, quick, easy, definitive victory uh, over El Salvador uh, in order to demonstrate their, their great anti-communist credentials and, uh, and dramatize the change from the Carter administration to the new administration. And in fact, what they've done is demonstrate that simple solutions to complex problems do not work, that, that they are making a grave error when they see the world, and particularly Central America, through an east-west prism. There is an authentic reason why you have a revolutionary situation in El Salvador. And if Cuba didn't exist and if the Soviet Union did not exist, you'd still have a revolutionary situation in Central America. So it's just madness to try to persuade 
the world or the American public that the way to bring about a peaceful, just society in Central America and defeat communism is to seek a military solution when clearly the interest of the United States and the interest of Central America are to find a negotiated solution that will bring the Salvadoran family together. Thank you.